This is a recording from the Community Garden Workshop on working with nature to create a vibrant and healthy garden. It was delivered by Gabrielle Flynn, a conservation officer for Bug Life. Here's part one, the roots, where she talked about ground dwelling invertebrates. So today I'm going to talk to you um, about the ecosystem of the garden. Um, I'm going to start off by talking about all the ground dwelling insects. So um, I'm going to talk about woodland invertebrates to start with. Um, but that's because you get woodland invertebrates in your garden. You get beetles, you get ants and that kind of thing. Um, so you can think of your garden as, as, as sort of um, encompassing um, sort of various different kinds of habitats on a much smaller scale. So you might have your little woodland area with your deadwood and maybe a tree. And then you have your sort of more meadowy area with different flowers and things coming up for pollinators. Um, so I will focus on, on the woodland stuff first um, and then we'll have a wee break, maybe make some bug homes and then we'll talk about pollinators and um, sort of finish off with. Um, I'm going to cover definitions first because it's always sort of best to start with that. Uh, come on. So I always like to start off my talks um, with a quote from my favourite biologist, and he just happens to be a myrmecologist, which is an expert in ants, um, and ants are my personal passion, so no bias there. Um, so he says, if all mankind were to disappear, then the world would regenerate to the rich equilibrium that existed 10,000 years ago. But if you were to wipe out all insects and all invertebrate life, then the world's environments would collapse into chaos. And that's because Every environment on the planet in some way or another relies on jobs that insects do, whether it's worms keeping soil healthy, whether it's pollinators helping plants to reproduce. Um, insects are really at the heart of everything that's going on. Um, I guess you could compare it to your own body. So um, it's all the sort of small things that are really doing all the jobs in our body. So our heart is made up of cells and our skin's made up of cells, all the small things. Um, and then our antibodies are the small parts of our um, immune systems are keeping everything going. So, so the insects are kind of similar. They're just this, make up this big sort of system. Um, so, has anybody heard of bug life before? Yeah. I think it's. <laughs> um, if you don't know much about us, um, then we're the only organisation in the whole of Europe which tries to look after all invertebrates. Um, and invertebrates are the biggest animal group in the world. So it's not an easy task. Um, our aim is to halt all invertebrate extinctions and to have sustainable populations of species. Um, we do this through mobilisation and inspiration, through talks and workshops like this, um, also by protecting habitats and recreating lost habitats like we've done in, on the Tapeworm Common with the Wildflower Meadows. Um, also by practical conservation, so looking after the stuff we already do have, um, and also by working with sort of policy makers and decision makers to ensure that they're informed en enough to make um, the right decisions, although we can't guarantee that always happens. Um, so what is an invertebrate? I'm sure you all know, but there's children here, so I'll, I'll go into it. Um, so an invertebrate is an animal which doesn't have a spine, it has an exoskeleton, but it doesn't have an internal skeleton. So this includes anything from starfish to worms to ants to bees to crayfish, um, sort of everything that's not fluffy, cute, feathery, or scaly. Um, so, also biodiversity. So, I'm going to throw the word biodiversity around a lot. Has anybody heard of that term before? Yeah. Yeah, most of you. So, biodiversity, all it means is the diversity of stuff that we have, the diversity of living stuff that we have. So, all the different kind of plants, all the different kind of bugs, all the different kind of birds, mammals, fungi, bacteria, all the different kinds of living things that make up our world. Um, the reason that we, the reason it's important to maintain biodiversity um, is sort of twofold. So the first reason is um, all the different animals and living things perform a specific job within our ecosystem that keep it all going. So they're kind of like the organ system in our body. So you've got ants who kind of act a little bit like our circulatory system. So because they travel long distances to forage and get their food, they end up sort of distributing nutrients along the way, so they kind of act like our blood cells. Um, or for example, <coughs> bees and butterflies are helping reproduction within, within the biological system. Um, so the, the second reason that biodiversity is important um, is that um, in the world, 
There's a lot of natural disasters, there's a lot of man-made disasters. Um, obviously the biggest one being climate change is causing a lot of unpredictability of our weather. Um, and so uh, if we have greater biodiversity, then our natural ecosystems have greater resilience. So say one big disaster, like our winter flooding happens and it just so happens to knock out a whole species. If you have lots of species, then you can ensure that the jobs are still being done because you've got that diversity there. So there's always something to replace and get the job done and then hopefully evolve over millions of years and there'll be greater diversity again, even more. Um, is there any questions about that? Okay. Um, have you heard of the term ecosystem service? No. Okay, yay. Um, <laughs> so ecosystem service is something that you might read in the media a lot but not pay much attention to. Um, it's a term that sort of has evolved in the last sort of few decades um, because traditional conservation wasn't enough for people. So imagine a, a lot of yourselves are quite into nature because um, you're all out here on a rainy day. So, um, <laughs> and so you, you all sort of appreciate um, the case for protecting nature for the sake of protecting nature because it's our duty and, and because we love it. Um, but for most of the global population, they need more than that. They need, they need to know why and what they're getting from nature. Um, so conservationists thought of the term ecosystem service. Um, and all it is, um, is a term to describe um, a job we get from nature. So, for example, trees give us oxygen. That's an ecosystem service. Bees help us create food. That's an ecosystem service. Um, going outside and spending time by your local green space helps you um, helps your mental well-being and your physical health because you're going out and walking and actually seeing nature is, is good for your for your for your mental well-being. So those are all services. So it's just a job that nature provides that humans benefit from, and it's sort of a way that we're trying to use to uh, make conservation more appealing to, to politicians and to and to businesses and economists. Um, and economists. Yeah. Um, you just got to talk a different language to different people, I guess. So why, why should we preserve bugs in Scotland? Well, we have beautiful things like the peacock butterfly um, and the orange tip, which I'm sure you've all seen before. I um, don't know if you can see this clearly, but that is a, a glowworm on the screen. Um, glowworms are actually beetles and they have six legs at the front. You might not be able to see them, but you can come up later and have a look. Um, so this is a female, and females uh, are the only ones that glow. So they have a glowing tail, and during summertime, about July, they'll cl climb to the top of a plant, and they'll wave their glowing tail in the air in the hopes that a male will see. Um, and the males, so the males don't glow, but they have <coughs> big eyes, so they can see the tail, and they have wings, so they can fly about and try and find her. Um, so 85%, so eight out over 8 out of 10 of all living things in Scotland are bugs. That includes fungi, plants, uh, birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians. 85% of all of that is actually invertebrate species. Um, so they, so they are sort of a, a big, big part of our, of our natural world. And we actually have 26,000 different species in Scotland, which is quite a lot for a small place. <laughs> Um, we actually have international, um, internationally important species such as the freshwater pearl mussel as well. So we have the biggest population in the whole world in Scotland. Um, they're being poached around the world for, for the um, pearls that sometimes appear in them. A pearl appears in every few hundred mussels, um, but people tend to wipe out populations just in the hope of finding this small pearl. Uh, yeah. Um, this is obviously not a bug for, for everybody that can see, it's a capercaillie, but we wouldn't hit, have things like the capercaillie if it wasn't for the insects that they eat still existing. So um, endangered species like the narrow-headed ant are one of their main food sources. Hey, ants? <laughs> I didn't realise that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they, well, they have out there on the river, mm -hmm. so yeah. Um, and we also wouldn't have things like the blue tit, which also rely heavily on, on the bugs that they eat. Um, so services, so ecosystem <coughs> services that insects provide, well they help us with pollination which is obviously the one that gets bounded around the most, um, so a third of, of every food source that you ever eat wouldn't exist without insect pollination, so 
you especially wouldn't have things like tomatoes, you especially wouldn't have things like sort of most fruit. Um, but also a lot of the a lot of the food that our livestock eat is also pollinated as well. So there's a lot of meats that uh, that we sort of couldn't have as much of if it wasn't for insect pollinators. Um, but also around 80% of our of our wild plants are actually pollinated as well by insects. And actually, we wouldn't have chocolate without insects because a relative of the Highland midge um, pollinates cocoa beans. Um, in South America, so there you go. The case for Ridge. Um, not really. No, no, not much. <laughs> I don't know um, how hard you try, though, is it? <laughs> never be, never be like a really yeah, no. um, So, uh, so bugs are also important for nutrient cycling and and filtering down water um, in our soils. So if you didn't have things like worms and ants um, putting holes in our soil, then the water wouldn't get down to roots and nutrients wouldn't get down and they take things about and they're an important part of that bloodstream that I spoke about earlier. Um, insects also like to eat the stuff that other animals won't eat, so dead wood and dead leaves, so they take the good stuff out of the dead stuff and bring it back into the living system again. Um, and also control of pest species, so big, big bugs eat little, smaller bugs, um, so big bugs eat things like midges and, and other pests like aphids. Um, and also we, al we eat we insect invertebrates and insects. Um, in Scotland, the invertebrates we favour are things like mussels and lobster and crab. Um, in other countries, they'll eat grubs and ants and all sorts of other things. Um, and they probably think we're rather strange for eating lobsters. Um, um, so I spoke earlier about uh, about about insects being integral to nature actually existing, um, and. Uh, and this is, this is obviously important to us as well, because we rely on nature not just for the oxygen and the water and the food and the resources, but also for that physical and mental health. Um, and we're learning more and more about how beneficial it is for us to actually be outside, um, even though it's something so simple. Uh, so there's a few studies that have been on the BBC in the last few years um, about how green spaces have a really long-lasting effect on your well-being, and that actually NHS could save itself billions if people were just going outside more and getting away from their screens. So quickly on to woodland. Um, <coughs> tell me when I'm going on too much because no, I will go on for ages. <laughs> um, so our Scottish woodlands and our, and our trees and our garden, they lock up our greenhouse gases and they remove pollution from the air. They're really important for that. They also help us to manage floods. So, so trees and meadows are really, really important um, and sustainable way, economically and otherwise, of managing increasing floods. So if you just plant more trees and you've got sponges there naturally to soak up the water rather than just dredging every year or sticking up wells every year and spending millions and millions and millions, instead you could just stick trees there and they'll, they'll do it for you. Um, it's, what's, it's what Germany are doing to sort of cope with increasing floods um, and a lot of other countries. Um, so we're, we are trying to encourage the government to go down that route because it just, it's, it's more logical really. Um, so trees are also form a really important part of the freshwater cycle, helping create fresh water, um, and they also help remove the pollution that comes from our agricultural land. So obviously in agriculture they use a lot of herbicides and pesticides, and trees and and, um, and meadows are an important part of pulling all of this up out of the out of the system. Um, they provide a home for wildlife, and they also are important for resources such as timber. Um, and they actually provide a lot of jobs, so 31,000 jobs in Scotland alone um, is provided by our woodlands. Um, so Scotland used to be, well Britain used to be covered in woodlands, but we now only have 1-2% to of our original sort of native woodland. Um, <coughs> most of our woodland is now, is now created for, for the purposes of wood production. Um, and a lot of that is non-native trees. Um, uh, other reasons that our, our, our woodland habitats are impacted is for things uh, because of things like uh, overgrazing. So because we have lots of deer but they have no predators, I'm sure you've heard this before, um, the deer eat the shoots of the trees and unfortunately that causes <coughs> new forests not... Uh, it, it stops them from regrowing. Sorry, I'm stumbling over my words. Um, so if we don't protect our ancient woodlands then we'll lose a lot of these surfaces and, and, and lose a lot of our native wildlife, which would be a real shame. So what kind of things might you find, uh, sort of more woodland invertebrates might you find in your garden? Um, things like the brown-lipped snail, um, 
so you can identify it purely because it's got that brown lip just there on the edge of its shell where, it, where the body is coming out. Um, you might not find this though, this is the narrow-headed ant, but you will find things like the black garden ant, which I'm sure you've seen a lot of. You also might, um, you also might find some Formica species um, and some mer Myrmica species, so sort of redder ants. Um, uh, you might see things like this, pearl-bordered fertility. So I saw that. Yeah, so this is, um, there's, I mean, we have many, many butterflies, but this is one of my particular favourites. Well, no, um, I have seen that one. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Um, and you also find things like the wasp beetle. I don't know if ever, anybody's ever seen a wasp beetle. Mm -hmm. Or if anybody's ever seen in their garden a sort of longer bodied beetle with quite long antenna. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those are part of a family of, of beetles called longhorn beetles. And I've actually just created a guide um, to identify longhorn beetles as part, of a, as part of this project actually. So you can go online and download that and if you do find any then please do submit your findings for the photo um, online because we're, we're trying to find out about where all our longhorns are because the records are quite poor in, in Scotland. So why, why, why are trees and deadwood such a, an amazing habitat um, and why are invertebrates so important for that kind of habitat? Um, so invertebrates are important for keeping your trees healthy because they take the nutrients that the trees need right down to the base of the roots, but they also stimulate root, root growth. So ants in particular are important for stimulating root growth. Um, and again, like I, I spoke earlier about the, the woodland um, the bloodstream, the way the ants and, and worms interact with the woodland. Um, but insects will also help spread your seed, um, although that might not be good for gardeners because you want to know where your seed's going. Um, but they're also important for, for pollination and, and as dinner for, for the other wildlife in your garden. Why are, why are wooded areas or sort of dead wood and um, dried leaf piles and um, and, uh, and also I guess bug hotels sort of so good for for your woodland and marshes well because dead wood tends to be quite a diverse habitat and um, and it's quite a dynamic habitat so it it can exist for up to 100 years um, or more depending on what size it is um, and all the time deadwood evolves and it's and it's good for certain bugs at the beginning of its life and it's better for other bugs towards the end of its life and um, so as soon as as soon as you have a freshly new bit of deadwood you'll get certain bugs coming to colonize it such as um, timberman beetles particularly like to come along and colonize really freshly cut wood and um, and then you'll get things like ragging beetles which will come later on in its life we also have fungi and you'll have lots of different kinds of spiders living within all the, all the cracks and it provides this just amazing nesting ground um, for a variety of things. Um, but then you'll have things like, um, so over there on the wall um, there's a so there's sort of uh, dried leaves from autumn that have, instead of being chucked in the composter, they've instead been put into a, a bug hotel just with chicken wire. So you grab a bit of chicken wire, put all your leaves in there and things like woodlice, centipedes, snails and earthworms will feast in there and, um, and it'll provide a really nice home. And because of all the sort of dying leaves um, and because of all the decay, it will become re really warm. Um, so it'll become a nice sort of overwintering site as well. Um, so uh, deadwood piles in particular are really, really important as a site for beetles. And if you want low numbers um, of aphids and if you want low numbers of slugs and snails, then you've got to have a lot of beetles because beetles are the tigers of the garden. Um, so if you look at the violet ground beetle and the, the, the standard ground beetle over there, um, you'll notice they both have narrow heads compared to their body. Um, so they've actually evolved that way due to their one of their main food sources being snails. So they get their head into the snail shell and yank them out. Um, <laughs> so if you, if you want ground beetles then have, have a wee deadwood pile and, and make sure you're constantly adding to it over the years and you're not just... So you need lots of different ages of deadwood over time. Um, so I've gone through deadwood already but uh, just to give you an idea of how important deadwood is, 35% of all living things in the UK rely on deadwood in one way or another, either directly or indirectly. Um, so 2,000 British invertebrates 
rely on it directly. So they either nest in it, they lay their eggs in it, or they feed from it. Um, so they'll eat the actual dying wood, they'll also eat the brown rot and white rot fungus that, that grows on it. Um, so, so when they lay their eggs, so beetles like to lay their eggs in dead wood, and once they've laid their eggs, uh, the eggs will hatch and the larva take between two to three years to actually become an adult. So wood's not particularly nutritious, so they have to keep eating for three years um, to actually gain enough energy and resources to become an adult, and then they're an adult for only a few weeks. Um, so it's, that's why it's important to keep adding to your dead wood pile over time. Um, like maybe maybe once a year or every six months or so, just to add a little bit more, because um, it's sort of, and bigger bits are better because more things can live in it. So talk a little bit about the longhorns. So uh, this little fellow here is the pine borer beetle. Um, you've got a musk beetle there, that's a sort of metallic green colour. You can get some really pretty ones. Um, that's the black, black striped longhorn and then the wasp beetle. So the wasp beetle not only looks like a wasp, it behaves like a wasp as well. Um, so it twitches around and moves around a bit like a wasp because it's trying to trick its predators into thinking it can sting, but it can't. Um, it's just a bit, bit sneaky. Um, so you can probably guess why the longhorns are called longhorns, because <laughs> they've got those long antenna. Um, so those long antenna are used not only for sniffing out the best bit of wood to lay their eggs and the best bit of wood to feed from, um, but they're also, uh, they're also sniffing out mates. Um, so males actually have longer antenna than the females do. Um, so it's actually only the larva that will eat the dead wood. Um, the, the adults will eat pollen and nectar, so they actually feed directly from flowers, so they act as a pollinator as well. So you can have quite delicate relationships within your deadwood as well. So, so we've got this pine borer beetle here who burrows a hole into the, into the wood, lays its eggs, its eggs hatch a couple of years later and then it leaves this nice little, nice little nesting spot for another creature, the pine mason bee. Um, so this is a solitary bee who creates its nest um, using mud. Um, and so it'll burrow into the hole, it'll lay an egg, leave it a pollen ball and then cosy it up with a bit of mud and then it'll lay another egg, leave it a pollen ball and then cosy it up with a bit of mud and, and so on. It'll lay the females at the back and the males at the front um, and then eventually they'll, they'll hatch and, and they'll leave the nest. So they're not social bees like bumblebees or, or honeybees. I'll talk about that in the pollinator section. <laughs> on to wood ants, which are, which are my favourite creatures in Scotland. Um, so there's not a whole lot of wood ants actually found on the central belt, um, but, it's, but I'll talk about wood ants um, because a lot of their biology and ecology is similar to the ants that you'll find in your garden. Um, uh, so we have three, uh, we have three type, well, two types of wood ant in Scotland. We have the hairy wood ant and the Scottish wood ant, and then their close relative, the narrow-headed ant, which is endangered. Um, the reason I'm talking about wood ants today, actually, is because I've just launched this this thing here, the Nest Quest. Um, so Nest Quest is a sort of a fun competition that anybody can get involved with. Um, if you come across a wood ant nest, so we don't know much about Central Belt distribution in particular, we know it exists um, near Aberfoyle in Stirlingshire, and we know it exists in Lowland and the Trossachs, um, but we don't know much more about its distribution. So if you do come across a wood ant nest, and you'll you'll see what it looks like in a second. Then then come find us on the website and tell us tell us about it and take a selfie with it or whatever you want to do. <laughs> Scale might be a bit wrong. <laughs> um, so wood ants are important because they help spread seed. They help keep pest numbers down. In particular, they're really important for that. Um, but they're also important as a food source for other animals. Um, so this is what a wood ant nest looks like. It looks like a giant pile of pine needles. Um, and they're very, very, very clever architects. Um, so the way they create their nest is with pine, like I said, pine needles. So they'll actually meticulously place pine needles in order to best capture sunlight to keep their nest warm, but also to ensure that the water runs off the nest. Um, now, if it's still too cold, then they'll send out workers to bask in the sun and gather heat in their own bodies and take it back into the nest. If it gets too hot, then they'll create tunnels that go through the nest for air, con for air conditioning. Um, they're also very clean, so they also they, they harvest um, the resin that falls off of 
uh, pine trees um, because it's antibacterial and antifungal and they spread it throughout the nest to keep their colony clean. Um, so they are very clean creatures but then again about the, the majority of them are female. <laughs> so so the, you, you only get males appearing uh, sort of once a year when it's breeding time. So all, all the workers... <laughs> all the workers, all the soldiers, um, all the foragers, all the farmers, all the nursery workers, all of them are female. And then about once a year, the queen will start to produce flying ants. Um, now the flying ants are male ants and they're new queens. Um, so the flying ants, the, the males and the queens, will, will leave the nest and they'll go off and they'll breed with other um, ants from other nests. Um, and then the males will die and the queens will go on to make new colonies. Um, so it's a very sort of short time that you actually do see male ants. Um, the Sabes, um, so they're not only good at architecture, they're good at defending themselves too. So um, ants communicate using pheromones and also by antenating, so touching each other's an antenna. Um, and uh, and when, they're, when they're scared or whether they're threatened, they'll release alarm pheromones to let each other know that, that there's danger. Um, and usually, traditionally, in, in ants across the world, they, they can sting. So and they, when they sting you, they inject you with formic acid. Um, but wood ants actually spray acid. Um, so you're not going to be able to see this very clearly. Um, but this is a stick being waved over a nest. Um, I'll do a close-up in a minute. And they're all spraying the acid into the air. Yeah, you can sort of see it. <laughs> Yeah, you can use litmus paper or even bluebells, because bluebells act like litmus paper um, and you can see just how acidic, how acidic it is. Um, so some animals actually take advantage of this. Um, so birds in particular will go and wave their wings above the nest um, to, to get the parasites out of their wings. And some, some birds have actually been observed take, picking up an ant and sticking it in their wing so that the ant will just sit and spray acid in its wings. It's getting a free shower um, <laughs> from them. So birds are obviously not put off by it. I'm guessing it's for larger, larger invertebrates that come along and threaten it. Um, but it, it's more foul tasting um, than anything. Um, so they're also farmers. So you'll find this with your black garden ants too. Um, you might sometimes see them herding aphids around your plants. Um, I don't know if you have in the past. Yeah. Yep, you have. <laughs> so, so unfortunately, they, they are kind of they're a bit of a friend of the aphids, although they have other important jobs. So, they will actually herd the aphids around the plants, make sure that they're always fed, but they'll also protect them from ladybirds. Um, and the the benefit that ants get from this is that they're drinking a, a substance called honeydew that the the aphids produce. So aphids pretty much drink pure sugar from plants and it means that the poo that they produce is pretty much pure sugar water which is very tasty and um, so the ants drink it all up and they take it back to the colony and they feed it to their sisters and they feed it to the young and um, and they actually uh, they'll actually also eat the aphids as well as a, as a source of protein although this is more important for the larvae the adults mostly only need, need sugar um, so this is nest quest if you'd like to take part in nest quest um, we have a uh, a flyer and a guide online as how, as how to take part. Um, you basically go for a walk in your local woodland, if you come across a big pile of pine needles, have a look and see if it's active, see if there's ants on the surface being like busy. waving your wings around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can wave your um, And then all you need to do is take a, take a picture with it so we can sort of see what size it is roughly, because we are trying, it is a bit of a competition to find the biggest and smallest. Um, <coughs> And then, and then you can either post it to us on Facebook, um, but also post it to us on our website where we're actually collecting the data. Um, so we're also doing a longhorn survey. Um, so you're going to find you're more likely to find longhorns in your garden. Um, so we have a longhorn beetle guide now, so you can actually identify them yourselves. Um, but it's great to submit photos so we can sort of verify that as well. Um, but longhorns are they're really important as recyclers and they're really important as pollinators as well. Um, so if you do find them, then good, <laughs> good news. Um, so how can we um, manage our sort of ground dwelling insects and um, that are looking after our roots and our and our and our recycling and our nutrient distribution? Well, providing a deadwood pile. Um, avoiding disturbing your ant colonies. So if they do come inside your house, there are ways of 
stopping them do that. So you can use things like citronella. Um, so citronella, if you put it across their foraging lines, they will not pass it. Um, don't, I'm not sure why, but they, they will not go over the citronella line. Um, so if they have a foraging trail into your kitchen, um, put the citronella over, over their foraging line and, and just keep doing it sort of every half hour or hour or so and they'll eventually lose that trail and it is one way of sort of stopping them coming into the house. Um, there is a more deadly way. There is a more deadly way, but I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> uh, it was a pest controller who told it to me. Oh yeah. And that's uh, equal parts of uh, icing sugar mixed with... Borax. Uh, Borax. Mm. All right, okay. I've, I've known that for you. Fair enough. Um, it does work if you lay a across your doorstep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> avoid avoid disturbing the colonies though, because they are doing a, an important job in your, in your garden. Um, also, sort of uh, encouraging diversity of habitat within your garden. The the more diversity there is of habitat, um, again, there's more biodiversity, so your garden is going to be more resilient, um, and you're also more likely to have things like the top top predators like ground beetles to deal with your slug populations and your snail populations but also ladybirds to help deal with your aphid problem um, although they probably will fight with the ants but that's okay that's meant to happen in nature um, but yeah so that's that's the sort of roots to shoots the roots the roots side covered we can have a little break now um, and then we'll actually create um, a, a ladybird and lacewing home um, so if you really want to up your ladybird numbers for the spring um, and your lacewing numbers, which are both predators of aphids, um, then one thing you can do is to create very easy to make little home like this. So it acts a little bit like a greenhouse with the sun going in and trapping the heat inside. And inside it's just got a bit of rolled up cardboard um, and it makes a very nice cosy place for bugs to go. Good to do with children as well because they can decorate the outside. Um, and then you just hang it from a tree and you'll get things nesting in there. But we're going to have a look at that after we've had some tea. Thank <laughs> <laughs> okay.